Around us, so much was and is being created and built. There is a lot of talk on how we of the problem. There are about 1.2 billion cars on the road today, and it is estimated that 70 million new cars are added every year. Most of the time we're sitting in our cars in traffic, producing massive amount of inefficiency. And it sort of gets us, gets us all thinking, what is the future of mobility like and how are we going to manage to move towards a more sustainable future but the question should be this why do we have to wait future why not doing something today as bertrand picard said last year at change now when he talked about the net zero solar impulse he said it is not the future it is what the technologies of today allow us to do today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cycling to a Better World, where we will be talking about how the cities change with um, new policies on mobility, including the promotion of active mobility. My name is Shuka Bedarian, and I will be serving as the moderator of this session. Our mobility session is broken down into three parts. We start with a couple of exciting panel discussions, and then we will move on to the last part of the session for an exclusive interview with a special guest from Brazil. We will start the first panel with Zen Wright and Come From App. I'd like to invite our panelists to briefly introduce themselves before we start the panel discussion. Lucille Alonso from Conformap, please. Yeah, hello, I'm glad to be here and hi to all. Um, I have a doctorate in uh, geography and uh, urban planning with a specialization in uh, urban climatology since uh, my thesis uh, focused on the modeling of uh, urban overheating and territorial vulnerabilities uh, to heat waves. Um, in order to have a systemic approach of the risk uh, in Lyon and Tokyo, and now uh, I'm in charge of uh, innovation and uh, resilience at uh, Resilience. And uh, I am founder and president of Conformap. Uh, so I'm here for Conform Up. Thank you so much. And Thomas Burain from Zenrite, please. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining this panel. My name's Thomas. I'm 31. I'm Canadian and French. Not French-Canadian. It's a bit different. Um, I'm living in Paris, France. I'm super happy to join this panel on how we can accelerate this transition. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, passionate about the big challenges we face uh, today, especially urban mobility. I'm actually one of the three founders of Zenride, which is a company that offers a bike leasing service to about 100 companies in France and 1,000 employees. Uh, and I'll be talking in the second part. Thank you so much. Lucille, we're going to start with you. I have many questions. Really excited to have you here today. Come from app is an app and choosing the best routes based on climatic conditions. Is that correct? Could you tell us a bit more about this? Yeah, true. Um, we propose a mobile application to optimize uh, travel by soft modes, uh, by bike or by foot. Uh, according to thermal comfort, especially during heat waves, but uh, in winter too. And uh, this climatic comfort analysis is based 
an, an innovative algorithm and uh, machine learning techniques, uh, which take uh, into account the real climatic condition, uh, the urban morphology and the different characteristics uh, of the territory. And uh, our application also works uh, so in winter in order to avoid uh, cold waves by uh, funding the roots and um, uh, that is the least exposed to winter conditions. Mm -hmm. um, a future version will, uh, will also offer calm um, um, roots without uh, pollen uh, to avoid area. Uh, prone to seasonal allergens, um, but it's uh, a future ve ver version. And uh, for comfort map, uh, this comfort and discomfort zone zones are different, and depending on the air temperature and the percentage of uh, relative humidity uh, in the and the wind and the solar radiation too. Um, and for example, um, with the hot uh, temperatures, uh, the most comfortable uh, routes will be the one of uh, will be the one that passes close to water bodies, vegetation area, or step trees, um, with a um, uh, with a, a sky view factor, uh, um, uh, with a building. Uh, uh, height uh, not too much, um, and um, in addition, the opposite uh, also works for cooler uh, or freezing temperatures, and uh, the most comfortable pass uh, routes will be the one uh, that avoids uh, cold weight and uh, windy areas. Um, so yeah, this is conformal. So this is, and this is the app that you can use for your bike, is that correct? Uh, for, for bike or, or for food, yeah, correct. Yeah, and uh, what I'm a little bit curious about is the story behind this app. How did you come up with this idea? Yeah, uh, so this idea of uh, these applications uh, seems uh, directly from my thesis work. Um, um, since the uh, modeling of thermal comfort um, at a resolution uh, of uh, 10 meters by 10 meters is the result of my research uh, of over four years. And uh, then uh, the idea of the commercial <clears throat> of uh, commercializing uh, and transforming this research pro uh, product into an innovative solution. Uh, was born in Tokyo in summer uh, 2099. Uh, yeah, 19. Um, and then on my second thesis uh, field international, internationally, uh, I had the opportunity to conduct a study of thermal comfort uh, for the French sports federations uh, to anticipate uh, the sensitive and the difficult area for the body during the uh, 2020 uh, Olympic Games in Tokyo. That's right. And so the app has not been launched yet. Is there a pilot for it before you launch the actual app? Uh, yeah, but this application is... Um, is about to, to be launched on uh, Android and iOS. Um, but also we, we have built a uh, API uh, that can integrate with your existing, uh, existing services. Uh, and um, I have a link to, to, um, to, to download uh, the application um, so if you are interested about that, uh, please send me an email to, uh, to have the link. Wonderful, that's, that's fantastic. I like to know how uh, it's going to work. I'm definitely going to download it myself right after the session. Um, I do have another question. How is it environmentally friendly and what is the sustainability aspect of this app? 
Yeah, sure. So um, uh, we address uh, employers and local authorities uh, who wish to promote uh, soft modes uh, and of transportation uh, to reduce their carbon tax, to decrease uh, parking space, to uh, and uh, increase the physical and the mental well-being uh, of their employees or citizens and uh, the safety of their daily travel. Um, we help to increase the number of days uh, a person use, uh, uses soft modes and the number of people who use soft modes daily. And uh, finally, for all uh, those people who drive to work and get stuck in traffic jam, uh, but don't take a bike for fear to, of feeling the climate discomfort uh, or their way. Uh, on their way, we have a conformer. Very interesting. So um, I'm, I'm just asking again to clarify this. So the app uh, can be used for bikes. So is it just a uh, normal bikes or does it also work for electric bikes? And how about other vehicles? Is it just bikes? Uh, can we use it on motorcycles? Uh, it could use by bikes or electric bikes, uh, by scooter tools. Yeah, it's possible. Um, um, maybe by, by food too. Uh, um, it can also be uh, used on uh, uh, while you're, you're running. Uh, for example, for running, you can choose a, a, a pleasant and comfortable route for your health and avoid uh, its truck on the run, on the run. So you can use by bikes, by scooter, or by foot, or by uh, for running too. That's really interesting. I didn't know that you could just have uh, have the app and use it for running. That's that's very interesting. Well, thank you so much, Lucille. Um, and now from Zen right, I I have a tons of questions. So so amazing. I had a look at the the website, and there's just so much to learn. So I'm going to start right away with all the questions that I have. Um, how was the company born, and what was the idea behind it? I think everyone would like to know that. First of all, yes, I think that's a question everybody loves to, to hear. Um, so the, the story is actually quite straightforward with uh, Zenride. Um, so there's three founders, Antoine, Olivier and I. Uh, we all had jobs before uh, and we used to commute by public transport, um, actually motorcycle and car sometimes. And it wasn't really a great experience for us. Um, you would be packed in public transport. Uh, in the Paris region, it's very dense. You would be stressed out in traffic. Um, and, and actually, the company I was working in that was a consulting firm asked me if I wanted to switch from um, uh, actually uh, uh, the public transport to a motorcycle. And I was like, no, I just want a bike. Uh, and we looked at services that were existing on the market and there wasn't anything on the French market. So we just decided that we were going to do it ourselves and we solve our own problem. And the idea behind the service is really to make it easy for companies to offer a bike to their employees. Very interesting. So Zenrise is a bike leasing company. Um, could you tell us a bit about that and how it actually works with the employers and employees? Yeah, um, exactly. So uh, Zenride is a service that's aimed at companies. Our, our clients are companies. Uh, and we actually work today with about 100 of them uh, from really big companies, 100,000 and more employees to smaller ones, uh, about 100 employees. Um, and how does it work? Once the company has signed up to the service, every employee in that company can go into a bike shop close to their home or their office or online, pick the bike of their dreams. Uh, and once they kind of find that special pair for them, they can get that bike leased by their employee, uh, by their employer, sorry. So the service uh, is going to cost them about 30% uh, of the real cost of the service, and the rest is going to be financed by their company. Uh, the result is that the consumer actually saves up to 50% uh, 
uh, compared to the purchase of the exact same bike. So it's a really, really interesting incentive that companies are offering uh, to their employees. Wonderful. And uh, so how can employers help with this transition? Because that's part of uh, the goal of the company from using cars, switching to bikes. As how, how does that transition take place? Yeah, so that, that's a really actually complicated question, because I think there's another question before is actually why would company do this? Um, uh, so that's why we we actually had a kind of a difficult time figuring that out uh, at the beginning of Zenride in 2018 because we were uh, trying to sell this product to uh, CSR teams. Um, and, and what we understood is that for CSR teams to, to manage and, and get their products onboarded by management, actually CSR-related products needed to be attached to a strategic project. Uh, within the company. Um, and, and once we got that, we actually turned our heads towards the HR teams. And we were like, well, every company wants to attract the best talents. They try really hard. They try really hard to retain the best. And they're always looking for new services to do that. And the bike actually, the bicycle service actually fits perfectly with this because with the service, companies are helping uh, employees solve one of their day-to-day -day problem, which is commuting. And they're actually also tackling one of their CSR responsibilities, which is the carbon emissions they generate with commuting. Uh, there's always a study. It's not the most recent one, but, but it's going to be updated by Carbon4 and INSEE, which is the French uh, statistics, statistics institution, uh, that said mm -hmm. that about 15% of emissions generated from mobility are generated on the homework trip. So... So we aligned uh, HR targets with CSR targets, and that's when we had the why. Now, how actually does it work? Well, it's kind of really straightforward. Uh, companies are basically financing the bike for their employees, and they're helping them kind of bridge the gap, uh, making them go the, the extra mile, and, and actually um, taking out the money part of the decision in their decision to switch mobility. Very interesting. So uh, have you gotten any feedback from the employers? Um, how has Zenride and this transition impacted both employers and employees? And basically, I'm talking about their behavior and the habit of using cars versus bikes or the other way around. How, how, did, how has that been working with Zenride? Yes, so that's a really uh, interesting question. Uh, and, and while preparing this panel, we, we looked into our, our data. So every time an employee signs up to the service, there's, there's now about a thousand of them. Um, we asked them, well, what was your main uh, means of mobility prior to signing up? And so the figures at Zen, right, are interesting. It's 40, about 43% were using a car. Uh, 4% motorcycle, so that's about like 46% of carbon emitting mobility. Uh, and another huge chunk was actually pu public transport, uh, about 30%. The rest being people that were already using a bike and upgrading or walking. Um, and what's interesting is, well, yeah, actually you're freeing up, you're, you're switching people from cars and motorcycles to bicycles, which is the most impactful emissions wise. But you're also freeing up free space uh, in public transport, and that frees up space for other people that are using cars and, tr and, and motorcycles that can't really use the bike because they're too far or, or they don't feel comfortable yet doing it. They might feel one day. Um, and, and that's they're both really impactful metrics. And I think the key figure to measure how it impacts a company is when we ask, we ask the 500 first uh, cyclist uh, a few questions and one of them was well do you feel less stressed than before uh, using a bike and actually 73% of them said yes I feel less stressed and I feel better and I also feel that I'm doing something for the planet and that's a huge huge success for us the last figure uh, which says it all for the company is 87% um, of the employees said well I wouldn't have switch to the bike if I didn't have the financial help of my employer. So, so that's super, super powerful.
Yeah, it's working as an incentive for people to actually do something that maybe they, they previously thought about it, but maybe didn't have the opportunity to do so. And now back to the sustainability aspect of it, which is always very important to me. Has this helped in terms of emissions, like CO2 emissions and air pollution? Do you have a way of measuring that, seeing how much impactful this has been? Yeah, so we have very concrete data on usage, not because we actually track the bikes, but because when it's uh, the time for the yearly maintenance, we uh, get the, the mileage from the bikes, at least the electric ones, and we have a few interesting figures. So the average distance that's uh, run every year uh, by our cyclists is about 1,500 kilometers. And we have a record set by a woman in the Paris region, 4,000 in a year. So, so we, we uh, actually congratulate her. That's, that's a huge amount, more than everybody at Zenride. So, so that's a great figure. And the calculation on, 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 um, on carbon emissions is a difficult one. It's very difficult to have a very straightforward measure. But we did an estimate. So we took the about 50% of people that used to use carbon emitting emissions, we multiply that by the average trip distance two times a day, 200 effective cycling days, because actually there are rainy days, there are vacation days, days where people won't cycle, and we multiply that by the average emission of a petrol car. And what we can say today is that we saved about um, 140,000 kilograms of carbon per year uh, and it's growing because every year we're adding uh, new bikes. That's amazing. Well, thank you, Lucille and Thomas, for your time and contribution. And thank you for being with us here today. Thank you. Thank you. And now for our next session, we have our second panel. We will be talking about Bluetooth and hydrogen fueled bikes and more. I'd like to invite our panelists to briefly introduce themselves before we start this discussion. Um, Maureen Billis, co-founder of T-Bike, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Maureen, so I'm the co-founder of T-Bike, which is uh, the first front wheel that turns any bike uh, into an electric bike within a few minutes. And I will be very happy to present it to you. Wonderful, thank you. Pierre Deren, Execu Executive Director of Clean Tech Open France. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to participate uh, in that uh, panel on the cycling mobility. It's very interesting. So. Uh, uh, the Clean Tech Open France is an association, but more than this is an ecosystem uh, that has become in more than 10 years one of the reference clean tech ecosystem in France with more than 500 startups and SMEs and 100 uh, partners, uh, private and public uh, partners with one goal that we are following since 10 years to contribute to the carbon and sustainability objectives in France and in Europe. Thank you. Pierre Forte, um, CEO of Pragma Industries, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm uh, the CEO of a company that is uh, specialized in fuel cells and hydrogen. And we have developed the first commercially available hydrogen powered electric bike. And later on, as I'm given this opportunity, I will explain you our strategy with hydrogen and light mobility and cycling in particular. Thank you. Uh, Maureen, we're gonna start with you. One Bluetooth wheel for your bike. Before you tell us more about this and how the bike works, I'd like to know the story behind this idea. I mean, one, I would have not thought about it myself. Yeah, sure. So um, the wheel was created by Laurent Durieux. Uh, he discovered a few years ago huge cemeteries of bikes in China. Uh, over there, there were thousands and thousands of bikes that were in good shape, but that had been thrown away. And when he saw that, he thought that um, 
it was a nightmare because the bank, when it's well taken care of, is supposed to live uh, forever. Uh, and he thought that a solution had to be found in order to give a second life to bikes in general, because the problem is not only in China, actually, just in France. Um, we have more than one million bikes that are thrown away every year, whereas they could be reconditioned. So he decided that he could maybe find a solution, and he actually did. So he gathered a team of engineers that had one mission, which was to find a solution that would be easy, that would be quick, and that would be very simple to install and to use so that anybody with a bike would be able to recycle their bikes within a few minutes. Um, the, the, the observation was simple, is that very often normal bikes are thrown away because people don't feel like riding them as much as before, uh, but also more and more because they want to invest in an electric bike in order to keep on riding while enjoying the assets of an electric device. And then they throw away the bike, the normal bike they already had. Um, so T-Bike was created. Uh, it's the first connected front wheel that turns any bike into an electric bike. And the way it works is very simple. You just have to remove your front wheel to replace it with the T-Bike wheel. You connect the wheel by Bluetooth to uh, the T-Bike application that you have downloaded on your phone. And then you choose your level of electric aid through the application, and then you can ride. So we chose the front wheel because it is the easiest wheel to remove and to install. And we chose to right. connect it by Bluetooth to an application because almost everybody now has a smartphone and it is a way to avoid to have a, a control box and wires to install. That's amazing. So from what I see, this is in a way focusing on some sort of an upcycling as well as recycling, which probably reduces the amount of uh, metal scraps and waste. Am I correct? Yeah, definitely. Um, T-Bikes helps recycling all the different kinds of components that make a bike because we recycle the whole bike. Uh, but even after uh, the upcycling of the bike, it is very important to us uh, to stay in this logic of recycling. So for instance, the inside of the wheel where there's the, the engine, the battery, etc., has been built in a plug and play system uh, which allows us to change any components in case of problem, to put a new one, and then to send the wheel back to our clients so that instead of throwing the wheel that maybe doesn't work away, you just and buy a new one, you keep your wheel, we just change what is not working. And that's very important to us, as well as the recycling of the batteries, etc., because we really want to avoid to throw things away when it's not necessary. And to go further, uh, we even decided uh, to start uh, to launch uh, a repair, some repair workshops with associations. So we collect bikes that were supposed to be thrown away. Uh, they are reconditioned by people who are trained by these associations. They usually are looking for a job, have some trouble to be in a reinsertion. And then they are equipped, once they are reconditioned, they are equipped with the T-Bike wheel. So um, we try to create new jobs to help people that uh, need some of these jobs. We recycle the bikes and we electrify them so that we can allow as many people as possible to ride again thanks to the, 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 the assets of the electric device. That's amazing. So on the side, apart from the upcycling and recycling and also contributing to health conditions of people using the bike, you're also creating job opportunities for the community, which is amazing. Thank you so much, Marine, for um, your time and everything. That was quite interesting. Uh, Pierre Forte, I've got some questions for you as well. I had a look at Pragma, and uh, as I'm not really a tech-savvy person, I'd like to know if you could explain to me a little bit more first about this commercially available electrically assist bike with fuel cell. I have no idea what that is and how actually these hydrogen cells work. 
All right. So um, a fuel cell is converting uh, hydrogen, the gas, into electricity. And so that's our specialty. We are making fuel cells. So the device that will convert the gas into electricity. Uh, the interest is the hydrogen itself, because hydrogen is a uh, synthetic gas. You have to make it. And it's a good way to store renewable energies. So when you have electricity from renewable energies in excess, you will produce hydrogen. And that's a way to store this excess of energy and then to reuse it efficiently when you have the need of it. So what we do, um, what is interesting with mobility, with electric mobility, is that you, have, you are at the crossroads, uh, the crossroads of two things. First one is the carbon footprint of the vehicle itself. And T-Bike and Marine, she talked about that. And how do we reduce the carbon footprint of, the, of manufacturing the, the vehicle by using scrap products, recycling, upcycling, and so on. So that's one component of the carbon footprint. The other component of the carbon footprint of assisted mobility is the energy of you, you are using to move the bike or move the car or the bus, whatever the vehicle is. Uh, where does this energy come from and what is its carbon footprint? So hydrogen is the way to reduce the carbon footprint of the, the energy we are using uh, by employing renewable energies at the forefront, making hydrogen and putting this hydrogen into vehicles. And then we have clean mobility. So what we do is we are trying to push hydrogen into light mobility. It's more an energy made for today, used for heavy vehicles, buses, cars, uh, trucks. And we are trying to push it to the general public with light mobility and urban vehicles. And the first of it is an electric bike powered by hydrogen. So how it works is you have a hydrogen tank on board the bike, a fuel cell, and you refill your bike with hydrogen, and then you have electricity to power the bike through the fuel cell. So of course, doing this, we have to, well, we are making the bikes, but we have to make the charging infrastructure as well to make sure that the hydrogen we are using is green. It comes from renewable energies. And how do we distribute the hydrogen through specific charging stations down to the bikes and the, the light vehicles? Mm -hmm. And how does Pragma aim to democratize uh, hydrogen as, as energy? Well, uh, so as I said, our goal is to try to make hydrogen available for the general public, the broader range of people. And we are working on the lightest and most affordable vehicles we can think of. So it's electric bikes, electric tricycles, electric scooters as well. The smallest the vehicle, the more uh, fitted it is for urban sh mobility, short trips, and the cheapest it is. So today we are very proud to actually have the cheapest hydrogen powered vehicle worldwide. And it is a hydrogen bike, which is now commercially available for, it has been on sale for two years and we, we have deployed 300 of them. And we are slightly uh, increasing the production capability to deploy more and more uh, hydrogen bikes. That's really interesting. So you just mentioned it, but I'm going to ask you again, just to make sure uh, these hydrogen cells cannot be applied for big vehicles. So these are just made specially for bikes and scooters. Is that correct? Yes, our specialty is really low and mid power fuel cells. And we are working very hard at downsizing the cell to make it compact enough to fit on board the bike and of course cost affordable to be uh, to be suitable for a bike as well so that's really our specialty my fuel cells the fuel cells of pragma industries they will not be useful for for car or bus but they are very very useful for light mobility vehicles Thank you so much, Pierre. Uh, and now Cleantech, Pierre Daron. Uh, Cleantech Open France is an association that supports and develops a network of Cleantech players. Could you tell us a bit about these players? Who are they? 
Ah, yes, of course. Uh, uh, so in the clean tech uh, players, we have uh, uh, the, the ecosystem players. So in these uh, players, uh, we have uh, 850 uh, players like incubators, uh, accelerators. Uh, those players are helping us uh, to uh, the sourcing of the clean tech solutions. Uh, all uh, today uh, in France and tomorrow uh, in Europe to uh, be able uh, uh, to uh, uh, to find, to source, and to uh, and to scoot uh, those uh, those solutions. Then we have uh, 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 the ecosystem itself because uh, we are always trying leverage and to have a maximum of. Uh, um, of uh, level effect uh, in uh, in this and uh, change now uh, is uh, one of those uh, ecosystem with uh, uh, with who we are uh, uh, we are working a lot uh, together like uh, uh, Solar Impulse as well and uh, we have also uh, the financial uh, uh, the financial uh, uh, players uh, in that ecosystem and those are. Uh, for the highlight, the networking, and uh, uh, and uh, the uh, the investment in the solution. And uh, last, uh, those players are both uh, public and uh, and, uh, and private. And uh, and last but not least, uh, the startup and SMEs, five hundred startup and SMEs. And you have here two uh, fantastic examples, and we are I'm very, very pleased to uh, uh, to be here with, uh, uh, with T-Bag, that is a uh, laureate uh, of uh, 2020, uh, and uh, uh, and also a Pragma Industry, uh, who is a laureate uh, of uh, 2018. Uh, so, uh, in those... Uh, uh, those uh, startups are uh, in nine different sectors because in clean tech we are covering a lot of uh, uh, a lot of sectors and we always uh, we very often say that uh, a clean tech solution in fact can be uh, uh, can be uh, uh, used in uh, in, in uh, almost all the the, the, the economy uh, sectors. We have nine sectors, which are mobility, uh, in, uh, in uh, renewable uh, energy, uh, energy efficiency, um, uh, uh, biodiversity uh, preservation, uh, digital and IoT, uh, new materials, uh, sustainable construction, uh, agriculture, and uh, uh, agriculture and uh, alimentation and uh, circular economy. Wonderful. So uh, I know that clean tech is uh, a the aim is to accelerate the industrialization of sustainable solutions. How does that um, get done by you? Uh, uh, that is uh, uh, that is done with your player in a uh, in a four level approach. Uh, first at regional. Uh, uh, at regional level, as I said, we source uh, the solution. Uh, then we highlight and uh, we network. Uh, we create a networking and uh, and good investment solution to accelerate uh, the uh, uh, the development of uh, of those solutions and those uh, and those startup and SMEs. And uh, uh, and then uh, we uh, we propose uh, uh, we help them to develop also uh, at European and uh, international level as we have also uh, an international uh, uh, network that is uh, Clean Tech Open, which is a, an American uh, uh, NGO. Mm -hmm. So how do the startups uh, benefit from Clean Tech? What are the plans for achieving uh, that transition that we need for a sustainable society? Mm -hmm. uh, so... Um, uh, the plan that uh, we have is... Uh, to develop uh, the clean tech open in France in Europe and to uh, to create with uh, again in a sort of scaling of our activity at European level uh, to uh, uh, to develop uh, the clean tech European ecosystem in Europe with uh, those solutions at the center and at the heart of uh, this ecosystem, of course with. Uh, uh, both uh, public and private uh, actors, uh, both French and European. Um, 
Uh, the, pro, the, 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 the objective is to give those, uh, those solutions the maximum visibility, the maximum networking, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and I can say, and, uh, and the customized, uh, uh, customized help uh, depending on their needs. Thank you so much, uh, Pierre Durand, Pierre Forte and Maureen for joining us today uh, on this panel. Exciting, really good. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you, Shuka. Thank you to you. You're welcome. And now our exclusive interview with our special guest from Brazil, Ana Carboni, elected president of the Brazilian Cyclist Union. Ana is a cycling advocate who believes in the power of the bicycle, a tool that can positively transform societies and cities. She's here with us today to tell us more about her work on this. Anna, welcome. It is a pleasure to have you with us here today. Uh, could you tell us a bit about the Brazilian Cyclist Union and what you're trying to achieve as a cycling advocate? Hi, Shaga. Thank you very much. Uh, the Brazilian Cyclist Union, we say UCB in its Portuguese acronym, um, is a civil society organization founded in 2007. We are nearly 14 years old and to represent local entities at national level. We advocate for cycling in general, mobility, leisure and sport. But our main objective is to promote the use of the bicycle as a sustainable, healthy and cheap means of transportation in urban areas of Brazil. Uh, today, as well as representing organizations that work to promote the cycling, cycling mobility locally, UCB also encourages and advises the le legal constitution of entities we defend the rights of cyclists and we are an agent for the democratization of the public policy development and implementation. This is something that's very important to us. Um, so that's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot, and it's it's amazing. Uh, there is a program I believe you are involved with, the Bicycle Brazil program. Uh, is it part of our, uh, part of your work as the Brazilian uh, Cyclist Union? Yes, uh, in two thousand and eighteen, UCB advocated for the approval of a law that established this program, the Bicycle Brazil program. Uh, we call PBB, and we signed a technical cooperation agreement with the National Mobility Agency. Um, soon after that, uh, the program aims to encourage the inclusion of cycling as a transport system in all Brazilian cities with over 20,000 inhabitants. Uh, Brazil, Brazil is a very um, urbanized country. 87% of the population lives, live in urban areas. Uh, so to effectively contribute to the expansion of the bicycle use, uh, the program um, has to be regulated. So we are now giving baby steps. We have very much been impacted by the pandemic that's going on. So to do that, to, to get this, the ball rolling, uh, we started to, the coordination of the, our national strategy uh, for cycling that will be able to guide the regulation of the law and public policy. That's what we want to achieve. So in 2019, we initiated this uh, coordination. Uh, we should be more advanced, but with the crisis, because we work closely uh, with public and private sectors and academy and organized civil societies. Uh, people, a lot of these people, they are in the front line of uh, the, the crisis that, the, that we're, that's going on now. So, um, but yeah, I think that uh, we, we have held 
events and online meetings in building the strategy. Um, and the, the, the goal is to have action an action plan that outline and a consolidated report. So we're hopeful that the next year is going to be a big year for us. Oh, I really oh, I wish you all the best with that. I know, Anna, I have a lot of questions to ask you, but I'm always very much interested also in the story and what actually inspired people to take initiatives or do brilliant uh, work like yourself. Could you tell us a bit about that? I know you, you love to uh, ride a bike and all, but uh, how, how did it all start and what inspired you in the first place? Yeah, uh, to me, I lived abroad for a long time and I returned to my hometown in 2014 and straight away I came, came back to cycling in terms of um, mobility. I always used the bicycle, I used the bicycle to, um, to go places since I was 13. So um, when I moved back, I understood that there was an, there was an absence of public policy that think and prioritize urban mobility uh, from the po point of view of the people and uh, the active modes of transportation, they, they, they're not being looked after, as I, I would put it. So cities or decision makers and policy makers, they focus exclusively in the infra infrastructure for private motorized vehicles, cars and motorcycles. Uh, nowadays, 80% of the road space in Brazilian cities is dedicated to cars and motorcycles that are used by less than 30% of the population. So the, a minority of people use this infrastructure. Most people, they walk or they use public transportation. A small amount of people were use a bicycle already and we, we, we want to increase this because Th this priority generates a number of negative impacts um, on the lives of everybody, uh, including travel time for health, for pollutant emissions. So using a private car shouldn't be the most convenient and the most comfortable way of, to get about. Um, so um, we have another big challenge is our current government um, because um, they've been against uh, um, the reduction of speed limits, for example, and to, they campaign against radars and speed cameras and lower speed limits. But this is something that gives, keeps my fire going, I think. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's super important uh, for us activists. We need to have that inspiration uh, from within, uh, which would then keep us going. Uh, so these politi uh, policies that you're trying to uh, put in place, are these uh, the focusing on only regional policies or is it going to be across the country or are you even thinking of taking it further? Yeah, UCB has been created uh, to represent local organization nationally. We, uh, we have, uh, our government is organized as a federal government, so there are legislation, in, and usually when you talk about mobility, the, the legislation is federal, so it's for everybody. Uh, however, we also have, we give, um, assistance and give um, to local organizations. So how can they influence the decision makers and policy makers in uh, putting forward better in initiatives? We had some wins throughout those 14 years. There's not just the bad. So uh, we had, for example, in Fortaleza, in the Northeast of Brazil, uh, we have a bicycle share scheme that integrates with public transportation for the first and last mile. It, it is a very interesting, you can use your uh, travel card, bus card to uh, use 
to to the shared scheme bicycles. So you can go home or go to work depending on uh, the distances uh, with the bicycle and you can stay with the bicycle for up to 14 hours. So you can go home, sleep and come back, put the bicycle back in into the, the slot and then uh, go or to work or to home. So it will depend on uh, the way you're using. Um, another city that has had an important um, move in terms of improving the situation for cyclists is Belo Horizonte, who has recently um, created a cycle lane in a flyover. They had uh, speed reductions and, and it connects important cycling infrastructure in the city. So this is very positive. Um, in Itaroi, where is in the metropolitan region of Rio de Janeiro, which is more uh, commonly known, uh, is my hometown. We have, a, for example, a secure bicycle parking, which was built and is operated by the local authorities. Um, and it's very close to high capacity public transport terminals. So these are very positive um, things that have been happening in this past um, years. Um, but we have a number of very ambitious projects as well. So sounds very exciting. Uh, I'm sure like any other advocates or like act activists, there are a lot of um, obstacles and maybe even challenges that you probably faced in order to transform this shift possibly uh, positively. Uh, because we whenever we talk about change, uh, it's sometimes it sort of scares us. So what are those challenges and how, uh, how have you been uh, able to sort of transform this shift positively? I believe the, the main challenge we face is a culture of the owning a motorized vehicle, a car or a motorcycle is something that to aspire. Uh, I will tell a little story to explain because this is very telling. Uh, I go to the same supermarket um, for, I've been going for a few years now that, and I know the cashiers, the people that work there. And every time they ask if I have um, a car in the car park because I need to validate the exit. And I say, no, I don't, I don't own a car. I do you have a ticket for the bicycle rack. I, I do have a bicycle. <laughs> and one day, one of the ladies said, oh, God will provide, we, you will have a car one day. And I'm like, I don't want one. <laughs> I do, it's a choice, it's not because I can't have one. It's just, I don't want to have one. I don't think it, I need one. And she looked at me as if I was saying something that it, it was it was a mystery to her. And that's the culture. We are, the cities are prepared for cars. People spend most of their lives in traffic jams, but they want this between brackets comfort of having that possibility. And that's the main, I think the main challenge to change that perspective. We mm -hmm. see now here, I think Europe is the same, but in Brazil, we are always seeing that young people are not as keen as having a driver's license as in the past, for example. So I think that the shift is happening, but it's very slow. Uh, we've been seeing also journalists with a different approach to news regarding uh, uh, traffic incidents or um, um, collisions and things like that we we've we've been seeing a shift so it, it has it, it is changing slowly but i think that's the main difficulty yeah that incremental change i think uh raising awareness and educating is the most important part for changing a culture or bringing a new culture but unfortunately uh, i i see it in all the areas in uh, when we talk about environmental issues that the the change happens but it often uh, seems to be incremental but as long as we can see uh, that we are moving towards that direction and moving towards a greener future I think that's promising and uh, 
that sort of keeps keeps the hope for us to carry on doing what we do. Uh, so um, what can other cities learn from your city and from Brazil and from what you're doing in Brazil? Any tips for other cities around the world? I think it is uh, very important to engage people on even if they're not cyclists or if they think that they can't use this mode of transportation, engaging people in understanding that uh, my choices are beneficial to everybody else. And that if I make cities better for people, for life, not just people, but for um, every form of life, then um, I will have uh, a better life for everybody, for people that are wanting to be healthier with cleaner air. And uh, so to, to make people understand that, 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 come across and go through like the message is we've been focusing a lot on communicating well. And I think that's um, very important to do something that uh, to be able to for people that are outside of our cycling advocacy world, uh, we've been engaging with other organizations that talk about pedestrians, about um, public transportation, so we can pull in more people. I think that's mm -hmm. the main um, and very important, very important uh, way of doing it. And have you been reaching out to um, international organizations or other organizations, NGOs that are not local? Yeah, we we do have a connection with Latin America. We Yesterday we had a workshop to talk about um, the World Bicycle Forum uh, Regiment because the World Bicycle Forum started in Brazil a few years ago. We are in the 10th edition this year. It's going to happen in Argentina. So uh, we have very good um, talks with Latin America, especially, but also we participate in events such as uh, Velocity Conference and to have an exchange with other parts of the world. We are part of the uh, World Cycling Alliance as well, uh, which is a uh, uh, it's, a, it's an alliance of um, federations and unions from all over the world. So that's um, how we do this. We, we, we do have um, an important um, exchange of um, ideas and to, to understand what other people are doing and uh, uh, positive change that's been happening in other parts of the world. So I think this exchange is it's extremely important and we are very keen on, on doing that. So we I spoke last year on um, several Latin American events and also um, in the last edition of Velocity, for example. So um, I think this is a, it's, it's extremely important. And are there any future plans? I know there are so many ongoing campaigns and projects you're working on at the moment, but um, are there any future plans? Yes, um, we, we've been coordinating the development of the Brazilian National Cycling Strategy. We also have the Bicycle Observatory, which is an online collaborative, collaborative platform. Uh, that brings together information, monitoring of public policies and civil society experiences in Brazil. But we also ad advocate for cycling in both houses of the National Congress. So our focus next year, at the end of this year, next year, would be to improve road safety for cyclists and pedestrians. We often work with other civil society organizations in order to, to go about this type of uh, uh, focus. Uh, there is a bill now going through Congress that would give workers um, that opt for the choose to go cycling to work, they would gather financial incentives. So we are uh, pushing through this bill to see if we are able to do that. 
Um, and I think that this, this work with um, road safety work is something that we, we, ha we didn't have at Edinburgh and we are, is, is what we're doing new now. It's, um, we last year we created a commission within UCB, we created a commission for road safety because uh, we started to receive reports of incid inc more incidents with, um, between motorized vehicles and cyclists. So we decided that it was time for us to take action. Um, so we're, we're building an important project around that, so. Thank you and best of luck with that, Anna. Thank you, Anna and all the panelists for your participation. I really hope that our audience enjoyed this session as much as I did. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.